Welcome to the uh, Truman Library. We're going to be, this is Mark Adams, the education director here at the Truman Library. And we are one of 14 presidential libraries in the country, part of the National Archives and Records Administration. And glad to participate in this program again, as we've done every year in the, since the beginning of the program. Today, we are going to learn about Harry Truman and the City of Independence. And I'm going to switch my screen here to the presentation I have for you. And for those on Facebook or joining us online, we could glad to answer any questions you have through comments or through the chat feature on Zoom as you join us on there too. For teachers joining later, um, we're going to pause at certain points where you might be able to do some interaction in the classroom as you watch this with your students at your convenience. We're going to switch the screen to the PowerPoint and then uh, begin the presentation. So as I mentioned, the presentation today is about President Harry Truman and Independence, Missouri. And um, we're gonna dig right into the presentation and uh, pose some questions for to think about. So as, uh, you, as students and teachers, as you think about Harry Truman and the city of Independence, of course, it's first recognizing where Independence is. It's not the most well-known city. There's a number of states that actually have names, towns of Independence, even our border state here Kansas, there's an Independence Kansas, there's also an Independence Missouri. I am presenting today from the Independence Missouri, from the Harry S. Truman Library and Museum here in Independence. And so a question to pose for teachers and students is to think about where, where in the world is Independence? Whereabouts in the country is it? Where is it located? Where is it near to? What's the context? And then as you dig into that and think about where Independence is in relation to your hometown, you know, maybe measure how far it is from your city or how far it is from other large cities in the Midwest. And then the second part of that, of course, is the second question on the slide. What do you already know about Harry Truman? And so your students can look at what do they already know about him. Sometimes they'll know that maybe that he was the 33rd president, or they may know that he's the only president to come from Missouri, or they may know some of the big decisions he made. So they might know about the Marshall Plan or the decision to drop the atomic bomb, or his foreign policy, the Truman Doctrine, or they may know some of its civil rights initiatives integrating the military, or they may some more about his early life, such as when he was a soldier in World War I and was a captain in France during that conflict. So there may be some things students already know about that, and then teachers could set up a brainstorming just to find out where students' knowledge is about President Truman, what they already know about him. So we're gonna move forward just to show you where in the world independence is. We are closely uh, connected to Kansas City. And you'll notice on my map here, we have kind of an unusual situation where we have two Kansas cities. We have a Kansas City, Kansas, and a Kansas City, Missouri, um, both separated by state line. And those are two separate cities, two separate city governments, two separate MERS, different school districts, all of those things, but they have the same name, they're just in different states unusual situation and confusing for people that don't live in the Kansas City metropolitan area. Half the time you don't know which of the city you're in unless you look to see the state line signs or you're crossing the Missouri River. Independence though is just 20 minutes from Kansas City, Missouri and Kansas City, Missouri and Independence, Missouri are very closely connected to Harry Truman's life and influenced him as he grew up. He worked in both cities, he lived in both cities the other places we have listed on the map for context, one is St. Louis, clear on the other side of Missouri, and then the other is Grandview. And the reason we have Grandview listed on there is that Truman worked on the family farm for about 11 years in Grandview. So one of the few times he does not live in Independence is when he's actually either in Grandview, Missouri, or he's in Washington, D.C. as a senator, or as the president, or even the vice president. He's actually born in Lamar, Missouri, which is close to the M on the Missouri on the map. So down in the Southwest portion of Missouri, but he moves to independence around the age of kindergarten. His mother moves him to independence for the public schools. And that's where really our story starts when Truman moves to independence and the influence of independence on his life as he grows up. If there are people asking questions, they're gonna be relayed to me by Tom. So he's kind of taking a check on that and he'll interrupt as he sees fit with any questions that we might have. 
So this is a close up of independence. And I just kind of want to pause on this map, just so you get a sense of all of these different types of buildings and places that relate to Truman. So we're going to start with where I am located today inside the building of Truman Presidential Museum and Library, which is at the very top of this map on the north of the map there. You can see that at the top. And then I want to draw attention to the scale. It's only 0.3 miles, uh, shows you kind of uh, the key there to show you the distance. So these places are very much close together. Truman would actually walk from the Truman home highlighted in green to the Truman Library when he worked here in this building after 1957 when the building opened. So just for some timeline, he's president from 1945 to 1953. By 1957, this building opens, so four years later. And at that whole time, he's living in what's indicated there as the Truman home, which we're gonna dig in and talk about that particular home specifically here in a few minutes. But you can also see some other historic sites on that map of significant interest to Harry Truman. You can see his boyhood home on the left side of the map, on the, on the west side. You can see the site of Bess Wallace. Bess Wallace is future first lady. So you can see the site where she grew up. Then you can see the Noland home, which is very close to the Truman home that belonged to Truman's first cousins. And that's across the street from what is now known as the Truman home, but really it belonged to Bess Wallace and Bess Wallace's family. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about that home a bit later on. You can see a sign for the first Presbyterian church. That's where Harry and Bess got married in 1919. You can see the Independence High School where Harry and Bess graduated in the same high school class. And then you can see Clinton's drugstore, which is basically a pharmacy, where Truman had his first job at the age of 14 in 1898. So you can see some very uh, closely connected by size and scale, and also very important places where they went to school, where they grew up, where they lived, where they had the first job, and so on. Um, so both Bess Wallace is intertwined into this story. Um, but although they graduated high school together, they were not dating at that time. That comes about a decade later. You can also see the gray box surrounding um, this whole area, which is indicated the Harry S. Truman National Historic Landmark District. So the whole district, the whole area has been signified by the United States government as a National Historic Landmark. The Truman Library, where I'm located on the north of the map, is operated by the National Archives and Records Administration as one of the 14 presidential libraries, as I mentioned at the beginning. And the Truman Home that we're gonna talk about is operated as a historic site by the National Park Service. So you can see those federal agencies have indicated the importance of those buildings and those places in the history of the United States. So you can kind of see a close up of the community that influenced Truman so much. So he did, he did talk about independence uh, in retirement. He reflects back in his memoirs and in various writings and speeches. And I've got a couple of quotes on the screen that kind of refer back to that. And then I'm gonna show you a video, although you may only get the audio, but we will try. Um, so you can see this first quote where he talks about walking around the city. Truman was well known for walking. He went on daily walks. The Secret Service and the press could hardly keep up with him. Even in old age, he was a very fast walker and he would walk around the neighborhood varying his route some. And so in this recollection, he talks about passing by Nolan School, where he first went to school in 1892. He talks about his old uh, other grade schools that he visited, and even his fifth grade class, where he had his future wife's uh, aunt as one of his teachers. And then in the second quote, he talks about uh, the high school that he attended, which, as I mentioned before, Harry and Bess were in the same high school graduation class in 1901. And then he talks some about independence's history when he refers to it as a gateway city of the old Great West. And what he's indicating there is he's talking about the trails, the Oregon Trail, the California Trail, and the Santa Fe Trail. Those trails jumped off from independence. So independence was a jumping off point for pioneers heading west prior to when Truman was alive, of course. Um, but Truman had a connection to that. One of Truman's grandfathers, Solomon Young, was a trader on the Santa Fe Trail. And he remembered hearing those stories from his grandfather. So we very well connected 
to those trail stories and the importance of independence in those trails west from 1820s to the 1860s. And so that was very important to Truman, who was an avid reader and a large student of history. I'm going to stop sharing the PowerPoint, so I may come back on the screen briefly. And then we are going to switch to the browser to see if we can see this video of Truman. We'll see if we can get this to work. And even if you don't get the video, you may well get the audio. So let's see what we can get here. Well, it's good to be back home. And what I call the center of the world, it's Independence, Missouri. I think it's the greatest town in the United States. And I've been all over the country and have been to Europe and South America and several other places. But I still like to come back home. And I'll continue to feel that way as long as I live. And I think you find everybody in Independence feels the same way about this town because it's the center of things for most of us. But it's the center of things for me. And I'm more than happy to be here and to stay here for the rest of my life. I hope it won't cause you too much trouble while I'm here. Hopefully you could see and hear that. Certainly hear it anyway. So that video, um, you should see the PowerPoint now. That video uh, was made after Truman returned to independence after the presidency. So he leaves the presidency in 1953 and that video was kind of his nod back to independence. And he promises the, to live in independence the rest of his life. And in fact, he does. He lives in independence until he dies in December of 1972. So obviously independence was very important to him. You also heard him talk about independence being the center of the world. I think that often harks back to the, the trails and the importance of independence as a jumping off point. And in fact, when the building here that I'm in, the Truman Library was opened in 1957, Truman commissioned a Midwestern artist, Thomas Hart Benton, to paint a mural in the entrance of the Truman Library and Museum. And that painting is not about Harry Truman. It's about independence and the opening of the West and it signifies the three trails as they head west towards Santa Fe, California, and Oregon. So that history of independence was really important. His own grandparents had, uh, were pioneers that came from Kentucky before they settled in independence. So we really had a strong connection to that pioneer history. If I just click on this, there we go. So I've well, mentioned a few times what was indicated on the map as the Truman home. That's what it's called today in 2019. But in fact, this home belonged to his wife and his mother-in-law. And basically his wife's family name was Wallace, Bess Wallace Truman. Wallace was her maiden name. This was a family home that belonged to the Gates family and eventually the Wallace family as, as the, the daughter inherited the, the, the home. But this uh, home becomes um, supremely significant for Harry Truman because after he gets married in 1919 he moves into this home and he lives there until he dies in 1972 except for when he's a senator and vice president and president and living in Washington DC. Uh, his cousins lived in the house across the street and so he would visit Bess Wallace from about 1910 onwards when they started dating. They graduated in 1901 they kind of reconnect in 1910. At that time, he's actually living in Grandview himself, but he would come on the weekends and uh, live, visit his cousins in the house across the street, the Nolan family, and he would visit Bess, and they would visit on the weekends. And so this, this entrance that you see, the front entrance there, this is exactly directly across the street from the Nolan home, and this was the view of the house that he would have as he crossed the street to go knock on that door to see if Bess was available to, to hang out and so forth. So they date for about nine years on and off, but he goes off to fight in France in 1917. And it's not until he comes back from World War I that they marry and they move into this house. So he moves into his mother-in-law's house. Initially, they were gonna look for their own place, but they eventually end up moving in. And Truman doesn't actually purchase this house until after he's president. And that's the first house that he ever owns um, comes after he's president. So it shows you something about his humble beginnings. 
And so some background about the house. Truman's grandfather, George Porterfield Gates, is the one that bought the lot. And then it's enlarged in the 1880s after the Civil War. And then after Bess Wallace's own father dies in 1903, Bess and her mother and her brothers move in with their grandparents. So she moves in shortly after high school. As I mentioned, they graduated in 1901. So she's just around 20 years of age when she moves into that house. But, and she stays there until she dies in 1982. So she actually lives 10 years longer than Harry Truman. As I mentioned already, Truman moves in after they get married in June of 1919 and stays there until 1972. Now, while Truman is president, when he's uh, during the summer and when he's not in Washington, DC, of course, this is where he lives. So it gets nicknamed the Summer White House. And we're gonna go back to look at the photograph of this house. I think it's a stunning photo. The thing to think about with this is uh, when North Korea invades South Korea, in the summer of 1950, Harry Truman is actually in this home, at home with his wife and daughter, they had one daughter who was born in 1924. They're in this home uh, when the call comes in to tell him that the North Koreans have invaded South Korea and he has to make the decision of what to do into response to that. And then very shortly we're entered into the Korean War. So uh, has a historical significance in that sense as well. Um, as I mentioned, they didn't purchase this until after the presidency. So he comes back home in January of 1953 after uh, the election of Dwight Eisenhower. And they come home and they start to do lots of repairs and fix up the place. And they actually purchased the house from Bess's brothers, um, the Wallace brothers. And he starts to work on the presidential library, although some of the things were housed there. The presidential library that I'm in does not open for another three years, doesn't open until 1957. So uh, if we had anybody online and, and had any kind of interaction, what we would do here is an activity, but for those watching this later or watching as a live stream, you can do some photograph analysis activities with the students, and I'd be glad to share this PowerPoint uh, with Tom and it could be emailed out or we can upload it onto our own website if teachers want to download it. This photograph is actually online in our photograph collection. We have 50,000 photographs, more than that actually, online on trumanlibrary.org and you can do a search for wedding photographs and this will come up. It's a copyright free photo, belongs to the National Archives and Records Administration, so it's free for you to use. And I would do some document analysis with this uh, asking a visual thinking question, what do you notice and what else do you notice and what makes you say that and then divide maybe this photograph up to look at and to examine. And I've given some hints along the way with the presentation but that this is the wedding photograph and it is connected to that house that we just mentioned because this photograph is taken in the backyard of 219 North Delaware, the house that Harry moves into. I'm assuming he moves into that day, this is the day they got married. Uh, this is their wedding photo. We do have another photo you can find on our online database of the group photograph that shows the groomsmen and the bridesmaids and so forth. So you can see a larger photo with some more folks in there with Truman's best man, who was a soldier alongside of him in World War I. And that's an interesting context. He's just got home from France. He arrives back in Fran from France in April or May of 1919 They'd already planned the wedding before they left, before he left for France. And here we are in the summer, in June 28th of 1919 for their wedding day. And interestingly, if you think of the year we're in now, 2019, in June of this year, will be the 100th wedding anniversary of Harry and Bess Wallace. So it's kind of a significant year for the Trumans in that they would have celebrated 100 years of marriage. We did have some questions about um, children and grandchildren. They had one daughter, Mary Margaret, um, Mary Margaret Truman, and then that was their only child. Um, she was born in 1924, and she passed away in 2008, so not that long ago. Um, and then Mary Margaret um, was married and had four sons. So Harry Truman and Bess Wallace had four grandsons. Three of those sons are still living, and the oldest lives in Chicago and is very closely connected to the 
the library. His name is Clifton Truman Daniel and presents quite a lot and is in fact on a stage play of Harry Truman as well and written books about the correspondence between Harry and Bess Wallace Truman. So you can see those and buy those and so forth. But he's a very closely connected to the library and a close friend of the library. I should say at this point too, because I mentioned their daughter, uh, Margaret Truman, uh, is that Harry and Bess are buried here at the Truman Library, but also uh, Margaret Truman is also intern. She was cremated and her remains are also here in our courtyard at the Truman Library as well. So this is the caption for that photo that I just explained where the, in the backyard of the family home and that's June 28th, 1919, almost 100 years ago this year. The second photograph to look at is again one that students and teachers can analyze and, and break down and see what they notice and discuss who is this group of people that seems to be following Truman on his walk. And he is president at this time, so that's a little bit different, a little bit different context when you have a president who could be around them. And so the students could speculate who was with Truman, who was around him. Some speculation might include his cabinet, his vice president. Um, more accurately, uh, the group around him are actually the press and also members of Secret Service um, for his protection as president, because he is president during this photograph. Uh, as you can see, it's in the winter. We've uh, not painted the town white. You can see the snow on the roofs and snow on the sidewalk. So it's a winter photograph. And it's most likely over Christmas break um, that he's home and he would visit most Christmases. Uh, incidentally, he would usually turn on the lights uh, at the Christmas tree in Washington, DC, and then head on home after that uh, would be the tradition. Um, and then you can see a number of people surrounding him. As I mentioned before, Truman was an avid walker, so they often had trouble keeping up with him. And he has his trademark walking cane uh, th there in his left hand, as he, you can see as he's walking. And that is the home in the background. That is 219 North Delaware, the house directly behind him. And the entrance to the house is just inside that second large tree to the right. You can see the entrance to the house that we were looking kind of face on a little bit earlier on. And we do have a caption for that one as well. So the snow packed sidewalk, and then it does give you the date it's somewhere between December 23rd and December 28th, because that's the time that he was home. And we do have Truman's appointment calendar online for the entirety of his presidency. So we know where he is on every day of his presidency. So we can narrow down where is he, where is he? And that's all available online in a database. So you can search that and see who he might have visited or if he went to your town or to your state. Uh, a teaching strategy there is to use this a photograph, either one of these photos or both or any photograph uh, to use document analysis worksheets. Um, there's a number of those available on docsteach.org, which is um, operated by the National Archives. I'm going to stop sharing the PowerPoint and just show you what that looks like real quick. So let me go to that so we can uh, show you that. If I didn't close it earlier, which I may have done. So let's see where that may have gone. It may be on this tab. It may be on my video tab, possibly. There we go. It's hiding from me. So can you see that? Tom, can you see that? Yep. Mm -hmm. so this is a, a document analysis tool that you can use with photographs, documents, posters. Let me scroll down and show you some of the different things. Political cartoons are popular. And what Docs Teach have done a great job more recently is created these for younger users as well. That's a recent addition. So you can see uh, the worksheets for elementary students or those learning English. So you can see photographs, written documents, and so on. So here's what the photograph one might look like. I didn't preload this one, so I'm risking the speed of the internet to show this PDF. And I can keep talking until it loads. So that's not too much of a problem. But you saw there were seven or eight different tools there, and then also um, dip broken down by age level. And of course, it's not going to load for me because it's just going to be difficult. It actually did load. It loaded as a PDF in a separate window. Um, I'm not going to go to that right now. But you can see the different options. 
and then for secondary students, the same categories, but the questions are a little bit more difficult. And you could look at both and see what suits your students best uh, as a way to dig into using primary sources, using all different types of media. Um, younger students, often visual media works really well. It can be a great way to start a lesson or to wrap up a lesson. So I'm going to stop that one. Um, I'm going to, uh, because we have a little time, show, uh, go back to the PowerPoint here and switch back. So you can see the link there, docsteach.org is where you go to that. And then you just click on the resources tab. You can also see, of course, um, lesson plans and materials created by teachers using those different types of primary sources. And they have a great set of tools for analyzing documents and different activity types that I would encourage you to dig into if you've not done before. So that's just a little teaching strategy along the way. Um, so we don't leave written documents out of this. We looked at photographs. We do have some letters that relate to this Truman home in particular. This is from 1937. And what's unusual about this, it's actually written by the first lady, although she's not first lady yet, but the future first lady. You can see the date on this one. It's November 4th, 1937. So this is when Truman is a US Senator from Missouri. He becomes Senator in 1934 and is Senator until 1944 when he becomes Vice President. So he's Senator for 10 years. And so while he's in Washington, Bess Wallace Truman is writing to him about some of the repair work that she's doing on the home. So you have that difficult cursive handwriting to struggle with, but we've transcribed that so you can see that. Now, what's exciting about this is that all of Harry Truman's letters to Bess Wallace Truman and all of Bess Wallace's letters to Harry Truman are all digitized and all available online. And guess what? They have transcripts to go with them as well. So the students don't necessarily have to struggle with the cursive. Uh, and, her, and Bess Wallace has terrible handwriting, as you can see. Um, but it's a great way to put those letters side by side um, to see that. If you prefer that in the print format, um, Clifton Truman Daniel, Truman's oldest grandson, has published a book of these letters as well that you can see in that format. And so that's a great way to look at the letters back and forth. Uh, there's some great letters from the 1920s where Bess Wallace Truman is asking Harry Truman permission to get a haircut, which is kind of astonishing when you think about that. But it's, it's in the letters. And without those letters, we wouldn't know these things. We have more than 1,300 letters from Harry Truman to Bess Wallace, all here at the library. And all of those are digitized and online. We have a lot less of her letters as she destroyed them and threw them on the fire. But we do have um, around about 120 letters that Bess Wallace wrote, mostly in the 1920s and 30s. So not when he's president. But that's just an example of a written document that talks about some of the more mundane changes they made to the house that they lived in as a, as a married couple. Then there's another activity that students and teachers can try that's on our website. This shows you a screen capture of that where it shows you the map. The Harry Truman Library is at the top of the picture, number 25. These numbers will make sense in a moment. And then the Truman home that I've been talking about is indicated as number four. So Truman would walk from the Truman home in 1957 to the Truman Library after we opened on a daily basis. And he worked here in this library for about 15 years until he died in 1972. I'm going to stop the sharing. I don't know whether I um, preloaded this, but it won't take long to preload from the browser. So let me go back to my browser and pull that up again and show you this very quickly. I went to the wrong thing, so that's always, let me stop that. Let's see if it will break out of that. Well, Sorry, I'm showing the video home. again. And, well, I... When things are live, they will go wrong, right? So let me try again. Let's see if I can find the browser for us, but I don't see one. Let me, uh, Not going to work for me. Let's go back. OK. 
Okay. So what you can do for this, it's not cooperating at the moment, but all you need to do for this is to go to trumanlibrary.org slash places. So that's the theme for our whole series with the Presidential Primary Sources Project, trumanlibrary.org's places. And you'll see a map just like this, both for Independence, Kansas City, and for Grandview. And then all you need to do, these are all clickable when you're online, and you can click on each of these buildings and learn more about them with a photograph where we have them of these sites. Some of these sites are no longer in existence, so and so it will tell you, but um, you can learn a lot more about those um, as you go forward, exploring all of these different sites, whether it's, and it's also, there's a thematic approach to it too. You can see uh, the various there's, um, jobs, all the different jobs that Truman had, all the different schools, all of the different uh, leisure activities, whether it's movie theaters or other things, uh, all of the different homes he lived in, all of those different things are all used as a kind of a theme that you can follow for each, for Kansas City, for Grandview and for Independence. So that's kind of a neat resource. So it's trumanlibrary.org slash places. And then we will go forward here. And then I just wanted to finish up with this uh, cool shipping crate. This is from the White House. So after Harry Truman uh, leaves office in 1953, as you can imagine, they had a lot of belongings that they needed shipping back home. And the law was a little different then. So any presidential gifts that Truman received belonged to him. Um, I'll talk more about that here in a second. But all of those items uh, were shipped back to the Truman home, the, the, what they indicate on this crate as the Independence House, no address, which I think is pretty fascinating. I think everybody in Independence knew where the president lived. And then those were all shipped to the, the Truman home and unpacked. Now, after Truman's death in 1972 in his will, he donated um, all of those materials to the United States government, which is why the Truman Library has all of those things. But there are some interesting items. There's some very old artifacts that were given from heads of state. The best Wallace Truman used as a vase to put flowers in or something like that. And some of those might have been a thousand or 2000 year old uh, Greek vases, or they may have been broken and in a shoebox in the basement of the Truman home. So there's a lot of interesting items that were uncovered. And it was at that time that we uncovered uh, Truman's letters to Bess and some other items that are um, rich artifacts that we have in our museum here in Independence. So with that, I'm going to stop the sharing, come back to my video. Tom, do we have any questions from Facebook or any other users? Let me just check. Uh, no, I'm not seeing any. Okay. So for the teachers that are watching this after the fact, because I know this will be available uh, as a stream, uh, my email is mark.adams at nora.gov. So if you use this in your classroom a little bit later on, you can certainly email me any kind of questions that the presentation might have uh, prompted from students or from yourself as teachers. And then I would encourage you to look on trumanlibrary.org and access our documents and photographs and lesson plans online for teaching ideas and for more research and resources you can use in the classroom.